Hi, Caroline, do you want to share your screen? Perfect. All right, I think we can see this on my screen. Yeah, I think we can wait a few more minutes to get started. Um, let a few more people join. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Caroline, I just want to say hello to you. It's Donna Burns. I know I saw you join. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Of course. Yeah. Happy to help. Patricia, Caroline's got a great story. <laughs> and I have to get it out of her. Yeah, it's an interesting one. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Just let me know when you want to get started and if you feel like enough people have joined. Sorry, um, I was on mute, but we can wait like two more minutes until 735. Sometimes people will join a few minutes late. Okay, yeah, no worries. Okay, I think we can just get started and maybe if anyone else um, rolls in, but thank you guys for joining Learn to Earn's third session tonight. Um, we'll be on investment banking led by Caroline, um, who's a Grunge Academy alum, so we're super excited to have her. Um, it'll be the same style, so presentation followed by Q&A, and if you guys have questions, you can um, use the raise hand or the chat if you want to stop and ask questions throughout the presentation, but I think we're ready to get started. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, as Patricia mentioned, I'm a GA alum. I graduated in 2014, and then I went to Michigan, um, and I graduated in 2018. As Donna knows, I was a liberal arts major, so I majored in international studies um, and Italian, and um, had a variety of internships throughout my summer in college, but ultimately um, got an internship in the investment bank. And then ultimately today, I'm an associate in the leverage finance group at Bank of America. So I'm going to kind of like walk you guys through what the investment bank looks at, B of, how it looks at B of A. And I think it's pretty similar across the street, um, depending on what banks you're going to. Some might only have an investment banking arm. Some also have a commercial banking arm, um, but obviously feel free to stop me with any questions as I give the presentation and happy to answer any questions um, at the very end too. So with that, um, I thought it'd be helpful to give a little bit of an overview of how most investment banks are structured. So specifically at B of A, global banking and markets kind of encompasses sales and trading, and then also the investment bank. Um, so specifically looking at the investment bank, you'll typically have a product focused arm and an industry focused arm. And the product focused arm typically includes an M&A group, a financial sponsors group, sometimes a private placement group and capital markets. Um, and capital markets is specifically kind of the, the arm that I sit in. Um, but this is kind of the broad landscape of how it's 
set up. And a lot of times within capital markets, you'll also have interactions with your sales and trading team. So depending on what specific product you cover, if you cover equities, obviously you're going to have a lot of interaction with the equity sales and trading team. Specifically speaking in leverage finance, I have a ton of experience working with the credit traders um, and the distressed loan traders. Um, so on any given week, I could be talking with them and with different investors. So generally speaking, this is kind of how most investment banks are set up. And then at B of A or a JP Morgan or like a Truist, you'll also have a commercial banking arm that's kind of completely separate. And that's typically either smaller companies. Sometimes you'll also have like business banking, which is like personal banking. If you have a debit card um, with the event, that's kind of the branch that the commercial bank follows. So flipping to the next slide, this is how the markets group will typically be set up at most banks. Um, so that's sales and trading, research, public finance and mortgage banking. Sales and trading is probably the ones, the, I guess I would say the group that's most well-known within the markets group. So within sales and trading, you're having, diff you're covering different products, whether that be through credit. So think of like a high yield bond or a leveraged loan, commodities, you're thinking of kind of an oil trader or a copper trader or someone who covers kind of those sales arms. Loans in special situations, that's another group that I think I work with a decent amount that could be a distressed company. So maybe one that's kind of looking that may potentially file for bankruptcy or they're just emerging from bankruptcy. Mortgage and securitized products, that's another group that I'm not as familiar with, but also sits within sales and trading. And then rates and currencies. So if you're thinking of transferring. Sometimes we have corporations that want to transfer or trade money from USD to euros or USD to Australian dollars. That's um, the group that will typically help with that. Um, and then within research, you typically either cover equity or debt. On the equity side, that could, that's typically any public company that's listed on um, a stock exchange. So it could be a US listed stock exchange or the London Stock Exchange. Um, public finance, again, those are kind of groups that I'm not as familiar with sitting on the investment banking side, but there's public finance, credit, and banking. And then in mortgage banking, you're having asset-backed securities. So thinking of a product that has tangible assets behind it. So like inventory or accounts receivable, things like that. And then you'll also have mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities and a few other products, which tend to be a little bit more complicated that I'm not going to delve too much into. Specifically within B of A, there, most of these groups are organized within New York, um, especially on the global market side. I think you want to have a touch point with what's going on in Europe and what's going on with Asia. Um, and New York is typically the best place to sit for that. We also have some offices in LA and Charlotte, just given where our headquarters are, but like I said, that can kind of vary depending on where the bank is based. Um, I would say New York is probably kind of the financial hub as I'm sure you guys know. And then switching to how the investment bank is organized, I obviously hit on this a little bit earlier, but you'll typically have an arm that's industry and regional groups. And so within those groups, you're specifically covering that industry, but you'll work on a wide variety of transactions. And I think when I'm working, I specifically cover consumer and retail and private equity clients. And so I work a lot with our consumer and retail team and financial sponsors. And I typically think of the team members that I work with here as industry experts. So they know how the markets performed within retail, for example. I think COVID obviously impacted a lot of our retail clients poorly. And so we were working with them, trying to figure out how the companies are going to recover, how we can explain that story to the equity or the debt markets. So they're either working on an IPO, a leveraged buyout. Sometimes they're just working on um, trying to communicate the with the company how best to make financing decisions. 
So I would consider them the industry experts, the company experts. Um, and then when you're switching over to product groups, you're industry agnostic um, for the most part. So as an analyst, I was industry agnostic, meaning I covered every industry um, that you see on the left-hand side of the page. And then as you get more senior in your career, you'll cover a specific industry, but across any sort of product. So if you're in equity capital markets, for example, a managing director might specifically only cover consumer and retail clients, but they'll do IPO offerings, they'll do follow-on offerings, they'll do pipe investments, which are basically a public investment and a private company. So in, within Leverage Finance, I specifically cover consumer and retail and private equity clients. So I'll work on pretty much any consumer and retail company that comes and wants to raise debt in the public markets, whether that be through kind of a leveraged loan, a high yield bond, a bank loan. And then on the private equity side, it's typically all leveraged buyouts. So thinking of taking some public company today and taking it private or taking or one private equity firm buying another private equity firm's company. So thinking of some recent leverage bias that happened this year, Michael Stores, which is the arts and crafts store that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Apollo bought them um, earlier this year and that was a great transaction. The deal did very well in market. So things like that. Within leverage finance, it's typically sub-investment grade companies. So the credit is a little riskier, um, the cash flows aren't as strong, and then switching gears, you have debt capital markets, which is investment grade. So thinking of some investment grade clients like Hasbro, which is a toy company that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, or like a Dell or a Microsoft. So massive companies that are all usually publicly listed um, and have very stable cash flows. They're very reliable. People think of them as long investments. So investments that are going to perform in the long run versus kind of investing something in the short term, like one or two years. And then specifically something that's unique to B of A is a debt advisory group, which I think JP Morgan is the only other bank across the street that has. But typically they're looking only at um, debt instruments and some preferred equity instruments and kind of managing how it's most cost effective to refinance or um, to fully redeem if the company is looking and performing well. And then specifically, I thought it'd be helpful to look, take a closer look at capital markets because I think it's a group that's I'm obviously biased because I think I'm sitting in capital markets. I think it's a great place to be. Um, but I also think it's a group that's kind of less understood within the investment bank. And so it is technically under the investment banking arm, but you have kind of three or four groups, which are leverage finance, debt capital markets, equity capital markets, and then rates and currencies origination. So under each of the, and then also debt advisory, which as I mentioned earlier, isn't necessarily um, a common group across the street. So under each of these categories, you kind of have the common products. So I would say all of these groups have some sort of um, product that they're always going to market with. So it could be a high yield bond if you're within leverage finance, it could be a high grade bond, um, it could be an initial public offering. So Revolve Clothing is one of the ones that B of A worked on that I think you guys probably all know about. Um, rates and currencies. So thinking again, kind of converting from USD to Euro or executing on a spot trade, which is kind of locking in a rate if you think you're going to be acquiring some sort of company or you need extra financing to make some sort of decision, operational decision within your business. And then also debt advisory, like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of ratings advisory, liability management, which again is kind of looking at the different instruments within your capital structure and thinking what's the most cost-effective way for me to refinance or to 
um, kind of manage my liquidity profile. So those are kind of across the spectrum and within capital markets. Those are, I guess I would say the, the five groups. And then looking at kind of what a typical capital structure looks like, again, these are kind of capital markets products, but when you're looking at any one of these products, you're also working with an industry team. So it could be consumer and retail, it could be healthcare, it could be industrials to kind of form an opinion about which one of these instruments is the right um, is the right fit for the company based on their leverage profile. So how much debt they have on their balance sheet, um, what their cash flows look like, what their liquidity profile is. So how much cash do they need to function and run their business? Um, so generally speaking, you have some sort of bank debt. I would say that most companies have that um, within their capital structure at the top. Um, and that tends to be the least risky debt, which is why you have institutional banks like a Bank of America or a JP Morgan um, listed at the top of the capital structure. And then obviously, as you move your way down the, the debt stack, um, it gets to be a more risky investment. And that's kind of where you switch off within different groups across the bank. So if you're looking at... Um, like a high yield bond or a leveraged loan, that's going to be a little bit more risky and you're going to have, that's where my group comes in. Going down further, if you're looking at kind of mezzanine or a payment in kind payment, um, mezzanine debt or payment in kind debt, those are kind of mixed equity debt instruments. And that's where you might get the private placement team involved. And then going down a little bit more, you have preferred equity and common equity, which is where you would have the equity capital markets team kind of fit in. Um, and as I said, each group kind of, each industry group will be involved throughout the capital structure. So sometimes we have clients that sit in the leverage finance space and they end up performing really well and they end up going to the investment grade space. And that's when they'll go from leverage finance to debt capital markets and um, the industry team, the consumer and retail team, for example, will follow them throughout that transition. I think the important thing to note here is obviously, like I said, as you go down, the products get riskier, but your returns also increase because you're lower on the capital structure. And I think the other thing that's important to know also is that you have different investors within each class of product. So at the top, you'll have banks. At the bottom, you'll have classic institutional equity um, investors like a PIMCO or um, a Prudential. So you'll have some of these bigger institutional investors that play throughout the, throughout the spectrum of a capital structure. And then I thought it'd also be helpful to kind of touch on kind of what day-to-day -day responsibilities look like, what the deal team dynamic looks like within, um, within the investment bank. I think some of these slides are a bit more tailored to how my team functions, but generally speaking, um, you'll have a core industry investment banking team and a product group. So it will always be a healthcare investment banking team. And then you could have, if you're working on a private equity client, you could have a financial sponsors team also working on the deal and a leverage finance um, group working on the deal. Or you could have a financial sponsors team and an equity capital markets team if the company is about to go public. Within the each of those groups, each subgroup will have a managing director or a director, which is kind of the senior deal team member. They're the ones kind of driving the process. Usually it's one of their relationships with the client. So if you're looking at like a temper Sealy, for example, who makes mattresses, it could be the managing director and consumer and retail that has that relationship, but they need some sort of equity financing or debt financing. And then that's where they'll engage a product group and you'll work together as two or three teams to kind of accomplish whatever deal um, is at hand. Below the managing director, you'll obviously have some sort of vice president 
where they're kind of working with the junior deal team to help the managing director or the director deliver on that execution goal. And then obviously you have the associate and analyst who is really in the weeds on the diligence process. They're the ones working on internal approval memos. They're also the ones that get on the phone with investors and explain the deal. They'll put together any sort of presentation or marketing materials that you use to help market a deal. Um, but generally speaking, there's like three to five deal team members per team. Um, it can vary based on the size of the deal. So I just worked on a massive buyout that was $30 billion and we had um, four deal team members within the leverage finance group. On the flip side, the financial sponsors group had eight because it was a, a big deal for their um, group. And so they wanted extra hands to have to be able to support themselves throughout the marketing process. So it really depends on the deal and the structure and also the client relationship. And then just hitting quickly on some of the day-to-day -day responsibilities of an associate or an analyst within the investment group, I would say modeling is a big one, especially in our group where typically because we're working with sub-investment grade companies, we're very focused on how much cash flow the company can generate. So how, what do their earnings look like? Are they stable? Are they cyclical when it comes to an economic downturn or do they have um, intra-year seasonality? So do they, are they a retail company that where the bulk of their earnings is made at the end of the year during Christmas? And then between January and September, they're kind of just chugging along and not generating a lot of free cash flow. So that's something that we're typically very focused on, specifically in COVID, covering a lot of retail clients. We were very focused on how they were going to perform every quarter or every month with stores being closed or e-commerce sales not doing as well because people didn't want to spend money and wanted to save. I think, again, looking at where I sit within the bank comparable analysis is also something that's incredibly important in our group. So whether you're looking at the line of business that the company that you're working with operates in, what their leverage profile is, that's a big one, um, especially when you're covering private equity clients, how much debt do they have on their balance sheet? Um, are they over levered, meaning they have too much debt on their balance sheet, they're not generating enough cash to help pay down their debt or service and maintain their debt is one that people in my group are incredibly pro focused on. And then use of proceeds. Are they repaying additional debt? Are they refinancing debt? Um, are they buying another company? Are they being taken private? Are they paying a dividend? Things like that are always really important in our group that we're always seeking to analyze and see how they'll perform in the market and how investors will receive them. I think whatever group you're in, research is a big part of the associate and analyst group. And that's, I think, where we really rely on our industry partners to be able to help explain how the industry is going to perform in the next five to seven years. So depending on what we're working on, sometimes we're relying on our industry partners to do the research. Sometimes we're looking at what's, what's available to us online whether it be through different platforms, through different banks that have kind of the equity and credit research analysts that I mentioned earlier, or are we looking at a data room, which is basically an online forum for a company to upload a bunch of information that we then as an associate or an analyst have to synthesize into something more digestible and more um, easier to explain to our to our senior bankers, basically saying, is this a good deal? Yes, we should do it. Is this a bad deal? Um, should we not do it? So things like that. And I think research, dovetailing into research is the due diligence process, which like I said, you're taking large amounts of information and trying to synthesize them down into something that's digestible to someone who's working on 30 different transactions and they have two hours to kind of, hear why the deal is good, why the company is good, 
um, why we should market this transaction. I think the important thing to know is generally speaking, as an investment bank, we're not, we might take on the risk to underwrite the deal, which means that we take the risk on initially, but you're also selling it to investors after that. So whatever deal you're underwriting, you want to make sure it's a deal that's going to be well received by the PIMCOs and the Fidelities of the world. And if it's not, that's generally speaking how you lose money um, when you're going to market with a deal. And then, like I said, when you're synthesizing this information down within the investment bank, there are multiple different committees and organizations that you need to go and explain the deal to. And so typically what you're doing is you're taking the research that you learned um, from Bloomberg, let's say, you're taking the model that you got from the company and you're looking at past transactions and you're putting together a presentation for senior people in the bank to explain why it's a good investment and why it'll be well received by the market and why the deal makes sense ultimately. Um, and then after that, typically that's when a client comes to you. After that, typically what happens is you'll sign the deal up through a series of legal documents. And that's again, where you're putting together, after that, you're putting together kind of the marketing materials to go and sell it to an investor. So you'll put together a presentation about the company, the investment, why the transaction makes sense, what are the key highlights of the company that they believe is worth showing off to the investor base. Um, and a lot of times that means as an associate or an analyst, you're getting on the phone with portfolio managers at those investor arms and you're explaining to them why you believe the transaction is good. And I think that's one of the cool parts about the job is that Usually speaking, when you get on these calls, how well you explain the deal, the transaction, the company to an investor, they're then taking that back and deciding to make an investment decision. And sometimes that investment could be a $500 million order. Sometimes it could be a $1 million order. It just depends on the transaction size that you're working on um, and how confident the company, how confident the investor is in the company. But I think that's a great part of being so young in this job and being able to see kind of a direct correlation with how hard you're working on the deal. I think after you get the mandate process too, specifically within the investment bank, and I think less so in sales and trading and something that I've come to really appreciate in my role is the relationships that you develop with a CEO or a CFO. I think it's really rare to be 24, 25, 26 and your job and to be able to say that you're emailing back and forth with, with the CEO or the CFO of a billion dollar company and one that you might see a billboard for when you walk by on the streets of New York City. Um, and I've definitely had that experience pre-COVID. You used to travel with management teams when you were marketing these deals, um, which I think is another great experience to have and not many people either within sales and trading or um, within like a marketing role at a marketing firm might get. So I think that's something that's important to note too. And then I guess just switching gears a little bit, you guys are probably a little bit ways off from kind of getting an internship, but I think it's always kind of good to hit on qualities and what people look for within these internships. I think um, as Donna knows, I did have some issues trying to explain to people in finance why there are merits to liberal arts majors. I think at least being a full-time employee, I've definitely seen that mentality shift and we do hire a lot more liberal arts majors, but I think the most important thing is being able to demonstrate your interest in finance and being able to explain that. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to come off the bat right out of college and say, I know how to do X, Y, and Z. I think it's being able to explain. For me, it was, I really like being close to the financial markets. I think it's really cool to be able to see how one macro event can shut down the market and there's no deals, there's nothing happening, which COVID obviously did. I think people ran to kind of protect their investment portfolio. And for a while, we didn't see any deals. But I think that's what keeps the job interesting and is something that um, 
people really appreciated that I that I followed and that I could explain kind of that's where my interest lies. I think coursework and experience is important, but I don't think it's kind of a necessary like, catch all. So like I said, I didn't major in finance, but I think being able to say, oh, I took an intro to business class or I took intro to accounting because I wanted to make sure I had those soft skills when I started my job is important. Um, you guys all go to GA or school like GA. So I think, again, the record of success and achievement, people see that right off the bat when they look at your resume. I think it's also important to be able to have strong communication skills and being able to show that you're a team player is really important. Like I said, a lot of times you're working with four or five people within your own group, and then it could be five to 15 more people in other industry or product groups that you're working with. And so it's always important to be able to show that you can communicate with those people well and also share the wealth of work with them. And so I would say some of the best ways to do this, obviously doing your homework, you know, reading up in the financial press. But for me, what was really important was being able to talk to other people across the street, whether they were at Bank of America, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, looking in hearing their stories, what they liked about their job, what they didn't like about their job, um, and kind of taking notes, okay, like that person really likes being close to the markets, or that person only covers individual clients within the private wealth space, and I'm more interested in learning about companies and industry dynamics and things like that, and being able to kind of filter what you like and find a role that fits for you versus kind of saying, okay, I like one aspect of that job and another aspect of that job. So maybe I should just do one or the other. I think you need to find multiple aspects of the job that appeal to you and being able to explain that when you're talking to someone, even in kind of a casual conversation or in an interview process. And then, so this is kind of, I wish someone had showed me this slide <laughs> when I was going through the internship process and when I was in college. Um, I definitely think there are qualities when the, within each of these categories that would fall into another role, but I think investment banking is kind of jack of all trades. I would say that's a little, a, a weird term to describe it, but again, I think a huge part of it is being a problem solver, taking all this information, being able to synthesize it down being able to show that you have the qualitative skills to explain why it's a good company, but also having the quantitative information to back it up. Um, and then ultimately being able to kind of carry that story forward to different investors. So if that sounds interesting to you, banking might be a great fit for you. For sales, if you are really more focused on getting on the phone with clients every day, talking to them, building a relationship, um, being able to quickly and concisely explain a deal or something like that, sales might be a great fit for you. If you are a very instinctual person, you're very reactionary, you're quick thinking, you can put together information very quickly, you're very focused on the markets and have a great pulse on that, trading might be a great option for you. If you're more quantitatively driven, you think you're a good writer, um, you, fo you want to focus on the industry and the market itself, research might be a great fit for you. But I think it's important to know, like I said earlier, a lot of these qualities are interchangeable. And so I think being a strong writer while being an investment banker is an incredibly important quality that I've definitely seen um, pay off in the last couple of years because you're able to concisely explain something. Um, but again, being project oriented within trading to know that you have specific clients that you need to trade that day, or you need to be able to be very reactionary on a certain project. That's also a skill that would fall into trading. So I think it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're an instinctual thinker, trading is the right job for you. Um, but that was the end of my presentation. I know I hit on a lot of stuff very quickly. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, 
Um, I can ask you a question. What do you think is your favorite part of your job or like day-to-day -day work um, that you would say? Um, I think it's really cool to be able to be 25 and say that the deals that I'm working on make the front page of the Wall Street Journal. There were a handful of deals that I worked on this year that made, especially the last one that I just closed was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for a few days in a row. And it was really cool to be able to be like, I'm the banking associate on that deal. And not only that, but I'm getting on the phone with the CFO every other day to kind of talk through a presentation with them. And then I'm going to help a PIMCO put in a $500 million order to um, ultimately get the deal done. I think it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of money flying around, but it's exciting to be able to be 25 and be in that seat. Yeah, definitely. Hi, so I'm not sure you already um, covered this, but I was wondering um, how the transition from being a liberal arts major to finance um, was made for you. Like, how did you cross that bridge? How I became interested in finance or kind of how I found the transition once I had started the job, not taking that many finance courses. Um, like how you how you got the job essentially. Yeah. So I think a lot, part of it is being able to do your homework. I think part of it is also networking. Um, but I think being able to explain your interests well, really well, and also being able to say like point to certain examples where you have the qualitative skills to do well in a job. So I could be working on three different projects at once and being able to explain why I'll be successful juggling multiple projects at one time, even if it's not because, oh, I took three accounting classes one semester um, is important to emphasize. I think for me, I, I also had found some information from KKR where the partners of the firm were talking about how it's important to value the liberal arts major. And I walked through the premise of that article, which I think impressed people in my interview process. Um, but I think coming up with tangible examples that you can point to on your resume and say that you have a willingness to learn is really important and something that now being on the opposite side interviewing candidates is something that I always appreciate when they bring up. Perfect, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, like I know you said that you and like your partners kind of take an idea to like the more senior um, people at your bank, but I was wondering like how many people really get to like have the final say on if like a deal happens or not? It depends on the size of the transaction. So if it's less than a billion dollars, typically five or six people within the bank kind of get, get the final say whether or not we're approved to do a deal. After working on this $30 billion buyout, there were like 15 people and that included the COO of the investment bank. It included um, the, C, the head of the investment bank, the head of my group, um, the head of the financial sponsors group, the head of our capital markets group. So it, it varies based on the size of the transaction, but I would say it generally is between like seven and 15 people. Thank you. What would you say is your, has been your favorite deal that you've made in your job? I think I've always liked the ones that um, have some sort of directly tangible relationship to my everyday life. So I did a deal for Chobani last October. I'm sure you guys all know their yogurt, but um, I thought that was a cool experience because you kind of, obviously it has the brand name there. So it's easy to explain to an investor on the phone what the merits of the brand are, but then also learning kind of the innovation behind like oat milk, which is they're one of the pioneers in oat milk behind Oatly, hearing how the company got started by the founder, who's also the CEO, um, and hearing how passionate he is about the Greek yogurt business. 
um, I think that's always really cool to be able to like work on a deal that has some sort of direct like, relationship or that you see in your everyday life at the grocery store or you walk by the store or you see online deals like that I've always found to be really interesting. Um, okay, I think that was amazing. If no one else has any questions, but um, thank you so much, Caroline, for taking your time to teach us and give us um, advice and words of wisdom. I think we all can say we learned a lot. Um, and for everyone else, um, next week, we will be having our next session on consumer finance. So like credit, um, like opening a credit card, debt, and topics like that. But thank you again, Caroline. That was amazing. Yeah, of course. Hope you guys have a good rest of your night. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.